Right. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so uh, we've been talking about many aspects, right? Last week, we spoke about how we can connect with people, right? Uh, asking important questions and then inviting them to receive the gospel and praying for them. So today, we'll move into chapter 8. I want to get into chapter 8, understand and reason. Now, this is a very, very important chapter. And I believe that when we minister to people, we must minister by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also with understanding. Right? We, we must also be able to reason and understand when we're ministering to people. Right? Now, the mistake that we make sometimes is, yes, we depend on the Holy Spirit. That's very good. But we switch off when it comes to being practical. Right? Sometimes you say, okay, only the spiritual is important. But no, we must also be practical, meaning we must understand and reason with people when you're ministering the gospel. Right now, we're going to look at this example from Acts 17. Now, in Acts 17, let me give you a background. What's happened is Paul has finished his first missionary journey. He's come back. He's launched his second missionary journey. He's gone into Asia Minor. He's gone into Europe. Right now, his second missionary journey, he, he plants churches in different places. So it's given there, right? Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus. So that's Asia Minor and Europe. So wherever he went in his second missionary journey, he was able to plant churches, right? He was able to understand their background. He was able to reason with them. And many people accepted Christ, right? So we look at what happened here in Acts 17. So Paul has taken Timothy. He's gone to uh, Corinth. And in Corinth, he meets Aquila and Priscilla, right? Uh, and if you do the whole study on the book of Acts, you will understand it's so beautifully how the Apostle Paul chose people and he used them in the churches that he planted, right? So in Acts 17, he goes into Athens. Now, Athens is in Greece. And in Greece, it's known to be an intellectual capital. Everyone know what's intellectual? Right? Intellectual means people who are very learned, right? Uh, so you got uh, Socrates, Plato, all these learned people, right? So they're all about, you tell me why, right? Reason. Give me a reason. Those kind of people, right? It was not, uh, okay, you, you pray for them and they will believe. No, they needed a reason. So Paul has gone to Athens. Now, what is the culture of Athens at that time? Right now, if we look at right now, what is the culture of India? Right? Cultures have changed over time, right? 20 years back, and what we're doing now, the culture has changed. Yes or no? Right? And, and so every place, the culture changes. But what was the culture in Athens that time? Right? There was a Greek goddess named Athena. Now, Athens had philosophers, like I mentioned here, Socrates, Plato, Domestetus, and Aristotle. Now, these were the greatest minds. These were people who were very, very learned, right? intellectually very great. Right? Now, it was a, uh, this Athens was a place of science, art, philosophy, and, and there were two kinds of belief systems there. Right? First one, was the Epicurean. See, if you see your notes, you see there, Epicurean, right? And the second one was Stoicism, right? So let's just open to Acts chapter 17. So you get a better picture there, Acts 17. Verse 16, I I'll read a couple of verses just for us to uh, get an understanding here, right? I'll read 16 through 18, okay? While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day, those who happened to be there. 
a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers begin to dispute with him. Some of them ask, what is this babbler trying to say? So it's mentioned there, right? Two people. What are they? One, Epicurean and Stoics. Now, who are these people? What are their belief systems? Right? Let's look at that. The Epicureans follow the teaching of Epicurus and believe that everything happened in this world by chance. I was born by chance. I got married by chance. I had children by chance. And I'm working by chance. And finally, I will die. That's also by chance. Right? And death is the end of all. They believe that gods were remote from this world and they did not care. Which means what? God is somewhere else. We are just here. We will live. We will die. So God is God. I am here. I will die. And that's the end of the story. Okay? And they believe that pleasure was the end of all means for men. That means God is there. I am here. I'm born by chance. I'm living by chance. One day I will die. So in this life, live a life of pleasure. Enjoy the things of the world. Enjoy everything that is there around us because nothing matters. Right. That was one belief. Okay, The Epicureans believed that. Then there was the second group of people, which was Stoics. Stoic, Stoicism was founded by Zeno. And Stoics believed that everything was God and that God was a fiery spirit. Right? And what gave men life was a little spark from that fiery spirit that happened, and it happened by the will of God. That every, every so often, the world is disintegrated and then it starts all over again. Right? So you see these two beliefs. One is the Epicurean, which says that God does not care. He is God. We are here. If we just enjoy the things of this world and we will die, that's fine. That, that's the end. But the, the Stoics believe that everything is from God. God is one fire, fiery spirit. And a spark of that fire came and we came into being. And eventually when we die, we'll join back that spark. Okay, so these are the two belief systems. Now, Paul is going there, and what is he doing? He's preaching about Jesus. He's saying there was a man named Jesus. He came, he died in this world, he lived, he, he was crucified, he died for our sins, but he rose again from the dead. He's giving the gospel. And the verse there in uh, verse 18, it says, what is this babbler trying to say? So this is a new understanding. We have the Jews, few Jews. You have the Stoics. You have the Epicurean. What is, he hearing? What is this? Now the Jews will say, OK, we are waiting for the Messiah. This fellow is talking something. Forget him. But the Epicureans and the Stoics, they are Greeks. So what is, what is he trying to say? They're not able to understand. This is some new understanding. But they were interested to know what it was. right? Why? Because the Greeks were people who were intellectual. They want to know, well, what is he trying to say? Like, what is this, this whole thing of one man came into this world, he came as God, he died? It does not make sense. Now, there were two reactions to this. Some of them said, this fellow is mad. Better not listen to him. Let's get rid of him. Let's kill him. Another group of people said, this is some interesting philosophy. So you come and you teach us in the, there's a place called Agora. It's a marketplace, right? Uh, I wish I could project how an Agora looks. An Agora is basically, it's the center of the city. And you have people who have all kinds of, you know, the learned people, they will come and discuss things. Right? They will discuss new ideas, new strategies. This is a place where um, uh, you know law was implemented, so people had any problem with each other. Yes. Yeah, basically like like that. But it it was called an agora, but it was also a marketplace. So there was selling of materials, selling of goods there. So it it was a place where everyone, if you wanted to know some new ideas, go and sit in the 
agora right now the agora is also called mars hill right uh, that's why they call this the great mars hill sermon right so paul goes there and he begins to preach the gospel so they say paul whoever you are your philosophy something new you're telling us you come tomorrow to this agora and you share more about this new philosophy you're talking about now what does paul do he goes there and he does two things he understands their culture one and he reasons with them everyone say this understand and reason so paul did right so we'll read on what he did paul then stood up verse 22 he goes to aeropagus he meets the, he and 22 Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Arabagus and said, Men of Athens, I walk around and I see that you are very religious. Now, what is the first thing Paul is doing? Does he say, Okay, okay, all you Greeks, you people are, you know, you don't know what you're doing. Right? You, you, you know, you're following some uh, stars and you're believing in some God. No. He says, he begins to understand them. He puts himself in their shoe and he says, See, I see that you are all religious. Because when I walk around, I see so many gods. You know, there was a saying that in Athens, if you walk around, you'll see more gods and goddesses than people. Every corner, there's a god or a goddess. So, what does it show? They're religious people. So, Paul is saying, I see that you are religious. But you know, you know, there's something that you're worshiping is, is not the true God. But he starts off by understanding them. He's saying, You are religious people. He get, catches their attention. Right? What does he go on to say there? I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar, right? Altar with the inscription to an unknown god now what you worship as things unknown i am going to proclaim to you what did paul do he's taking what they have and he's presenting the gospel to them right now he reasoned with the people in the jews and the synagogues and with the gentile worshipers in this marketplace now epicureans and stoics both of them disagreed with the gospel. They did not accept the gospel. They could not understand it. Right Now, Paul goes there and he says, without condemning, he appreciates them for their inclination towards God. He said, see, I see that you all are religious people. So that's very good. So what is the important point to, you know, for each one of us? is recognize where people are at their spiritual quest. Many people are searching, but are they searching for the right thing? Right? You will meet people who are searching for peace. You will meet people who are searching for true meaning in life, for purpose, for direction. Right? You may have some, some you know, maybe you meet with somebody and they'll say, hey, I uh, I don't know what is life all about. What should I do in life? I mean, you know, just work hard, earn money, get married, have children, and then one day die. Well, what's the purpose? What am I going to do with that? In the end, we are not taking anything. So there are people, right? There are people who have uh, suicidal. I say uh, I don't want to live. I see only uh, people who are, you know. Uh, broken or people in my own life i see that everyone are enjoying but for me it's nothing i feel empty i have no family so you'll find different people in different seasons of their life very important is to recognize put yourself in their shoes right if somebody is going through depression don't say why you're depressed so many things are there no be, be happy enjoy life don't say that they are going through their own problem. So we must recognize it first. Right? Put yourself in their shoes. Right? And Paul did that. He went and he said, I, I see that you all are religious. 
he put himself in their shoes now what is what will happen if you go on they said they were listening intently to what apostle paul was saying right their ears were turned to them and goes on he then addresses their ignorance which they have admitted in the inscription to an unknown god right use something they relate to and understand and use that as a starting point right now what did apostle paul do he said see one i see you all are religious he puts himself in their shoes two he uses their own point of uh, starting a conversation he says i see that you have a you know a temple there and it says to an unknown god so now what you don't know what you have called unknown let me share with you so what's he doing he's first understood them now he's begin to reasoning he begins to reason with them and say okay let me tell you who this god is you put unknown god by your ignorance you don't know but i will tell you he's beginning to reason with them you see how powerful that is right understanding the people and then begin to reason with them now for example uh, i'm just going to use this example right there was this one time if 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 a muslim person from a islamic faith comes to you what is the thing that you and i can do what's the first thing that we can do talk about talk about the way they pray okay what else okay very good what else if it's somebody from a islamic faith so you you have a starting point what is the starting point what is the uh, you know the relation between a christian and a muslim what is something that is common the first five books of pentateuch yeah right so you have a starting point of reference okay two if you're ministering to a jehovah witness right somebody comes and say i'm jehovah witness what are you going to start off with what is your starting point sorry father god okay so how are you going to talk about it what 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 can you uh, bring out you also pray to the father okay sorry believe in the same god okay so if if i was there or i would bring out the attributes of jehovah first first i would understand this person oh you believing in jehovah so i begin to talk about his attributes he is jehovah jaira jehovah rafa this is this jehovah shalom jehovah. and i ask him him or her i ask uh, do you have peace in your heart do you find healing in your body he says no not yet so how is this jehovah working in your life how do you how do you know that he's you know he's god up there but how do you know he's ministering to you and he ministered to moses he ministered to abraham but how is he ministering to you right and slowly bring out the whole aspect of the son and the holy spirit now it's not going to be easy but you have a starting reference point yes third if you're speaking to a person from a hindu faith right what is the starting reference point that you can bring about worship okay what else come on some of you were from that faith sorry no so first thing i have to understand i can't ask questions first right so asking questions is part of it but now i'm trying to understand them and then reason right okay religious mm, mm, mm. anything else if you if you're ministering to a person from a hindu faith Vimal, come on. Mm, that's the word I was looking for. Very good. Okay. So, no, more importantly, I wanted that word. Effort. Works. They have a lot of works.
yeah so yeah so the main word i was looking for was works so if you look at the hindu faith it's more about works if i do this then god is pleased if i do this then god is pleased maybe god will not allow me to you know go through this pain and trouble because i have done this or maybe if i do this so it's a lot of works right so you can start off from that point how much can we do that pleases god how do we know god is pleased with the works that we are doing what is the baseline right in some places um, you know killing a child is wrong in some places it's all right right but so what's the baseline how to tell which is good what is right what is right what is wrong there's no baseline so with different religious backgrounds always understand them and use something as a starting point of reference which is common apostle paul did that he didn't question he didn't say you are doing the wrong things you know if you do this you'll go to hell you know if you do this you'll bring a curse upon yourself he didn't do all that he says hey you are religious but let me show you what it is that you have mentioned to an unknown god let me tell you what it is right <clears throat> third one he goes on to say verse 28 17 verse 28 for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets have said we are his offspring now this is powerful i can just picture this right apostle paul has you know met with the people in athens and they said you come tomorrow and preach in the marketplace in the agora Do you think he would have gone home and chuma, you know, just sat around doing nothing, just looking here and there? He would. I feel that he would have gone and read about the culture, and he's using their point of reference, their own writers, their own poets to bring about a truth. Right. So what does he say here? As your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now see. Paul is telling the the Greeks. See, I'm not saying your own poet is saying we are his offspring. We are his children. So that means we are not born out of chance. We are his children. Your poet is saying. I'm not saying. Two, the Stoics are saying we are. You know, we just come through a fire, the main fire, and from that fire a spark, and we've come into being. But your poet is saying we are offsprings. So what is happening now? If I am a Greek, I am from Greece, and I am a Stoic or an Epicurean, I'm thinking, oh, our own prophet, our own poet has said this. Our own poet has said we are his offspring. Then I have to read about it. Then I have to understand it. Now, you must remember that in Athens, many people had many philosophies, many ideas, but the but the general regular congregation, people in the You know, people in living in the city, they just accepted everything. Whatever is said, they've accepted. Whether they've done research or no, that is secondary. But okay, he's telling, so okay, good, accepted. But Paul is he's educating his own people, the people there, and saying, your own poets, your own people have said we are his offspring. So we are not come from the sun, from a fire ball, nor have we come here by chance. We are his offspring. right so he let them know that the apostle paul let them know that he's made an effort to let to get to know them right to get to know their belief system to get to know their culture to know their backgrounds now if you and i for example are to minister to maybe a mormon or a jehovah's witness or a muslim or a or a hindu we must do our homework right so if you have a friend who's a muslim what what must you do you have a point of reference but you must read about what they believe in what does their book say what is their general teaching so there's a bit of a homework that we must do right 
Now, this may not sound like fun because you feel like sometimes, you know, Holy Spirit, you only minister to them and they become believers. That is nice. But there are some peoples like the some people like people in Greece who say you want to want a reason. What is the reason for me to believe in Jesus? Why should I believe? Right? Why should I let go of what I'm believing and believe in Jesus? So there, there must be some kind of reasoning, right? And so if you're sharing, I want to encourage you, be prepared, right? Be prepared both ways, to the, the person from the other faith and in your faith. Be prepared to minister. Why? People will ask you. One, uh, I was in, uh, I think it was Odisha. We were there and we finished a worship session there and then we were going into the sessions and one... One new believer, he asked me a simple question. Why do we worship? He's just become a believer, maybe a week old. He joined the short-term Bible college there. And he asked me, why do we worship in song? Simple question. Right? Well, what is the answer? Because we don't have any other thing to do? Because we know how to play guitar and uh, keyboard? What is the answer? Because I know how to sing? What is the answer? Why do we worship? Okay. Okay. He's worthy. Yeah, he's commanded us to worship. Simple. He's told us worship him. One, two, because he's worthy of worship. Three, it's not about our gift and talents. It's very less about that. That is given just to help us. I don't need a guitar. I don't need a keyboard. I don't need to sing in tune to worship God. Right? So if you feel that you don't know how to play an instrument, you don't know how to sing, worship is not about that. Worship is about worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Right? So, so it's more about, it's not about, you know, just doing things just because I'm doing it. Right? It's about understanding why we are doing it. So we must be willing to give answers. Right? Imagine, you know, when I was in Bible college, when we, we used to go to, when I was in Bible college, I used to lead at uh, worship at the locations, either north, south, east, west, sometimes at central. And they, they would come and sometimes, you know, that time we were about 400 odd people, I think, 350, 400 people in church. Uh, especially at Central. So after leading the worship at Central, they will come and ask me, uh, how does God minister to you during worship? How did God give you this word? Or how did God, uh, how did you, you know, do this song? What, what was going through your mind? They'll ask you. So what are you going to say? No, I just made a list of five songs. We practiced for two hours and we went and sang the songs. I was sharing in the second years today. There were times when, uh, you know, 2014, 15, uh, when I used to read at Central, I used to read almost two, three Sundays because there were very few worship leaders during those times. So two Sundays I would be Central, some of the Sundays at the locations. And there's, we used to practice, we used to rehearse, right? So two hours of rehearsal, we had a full band, very tight set, right? So we'll finish a tight set. And many times I've walked off the stage, I knew the set was really good. Musically, very tight. If you listen to it, it's wonderful. Everything, the guitars, the keyboards, the vocals, everything was perfect. But I walked out of that stage many times feeling empty. God, why am I feeling this way? Many times the Lord has ministered to me saying, because you prayed, I mean, you practiced and rehearsed for two hours. Very good. But you prayed only for half an hour. Rehearsal is important. Two hours is good. But you prayed only for half an hour. Everyone came and said, Oh, brother, very nice worship. But in my heart, I was, Lord, something is wrong. I listened to the recording. Very nice. Everything is nice. But my heart is still dry. I said, God, why am I feeling this way? Because I've done something out of just doing it. There was, there was no, the root of it was not out of the spirit. 
You get what I'm saying, right? Many times, especially as pastors, and you know, each one of you will get an opportunity to lead worship, preach, and over the years, it becomes a habit, right? You tell me, okay, preach for the next one hour. We can pick up a topic and preach, but is it out of the spirit, right? So Paul here. He's, he's, he's helping us to understand that even as, as we reason with people, even as we understand, we must do our homework. We must spend time in prayer. We must ask God for wisdom. Right? Prayer is the basis of our ministry. Yes? Right? See, we can depend on our gifts and our talents, but it will only take us to some place. Right? It is only prayer and character that can keep us there. How long can we depend on our gifts and talents? There will come somebody else better than us. What will do? Right. Imagine you're the, you know, there's, you're the best worship leader in the church. And you know, okay, I'm the main worship leader. But suddenly somebody else will come. He plays all the instruments. What will you do? Oh God, now what am I going to do? That means what? Our identity, our strength is in our talents. It's supposed to be in God. Our identity is supposed to be in Christ. Right? And out of that flows everything else. Right? So whether people come who are much better than you, good. But what God has for you is for you. Right? I always used to tell uh, you know, 2000. 11, 12, when I started leading at Central, I used to think, oh man, these guys are so good. Very good musicians. And I didn't know this whole number system. They will say, okay, play four, play three. I'd be wondering, what is three? What is four? <laughs> you know, you got the MD saying, MD is the music director. He, he tells everyone on the stage what to play. Right? Not always, but he directs the whole. So he says, okay, play the three minor. Let's go to six. Stay on the bridge. And you have to do the right thing. There's a click happening. And it's, I thought to myself, hey, these guys are so much better than me. I'm not supposed to be here leading the people in worship. But one thing I realized that if you don't depend on your gifts and talents, if God has something for you, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody. Nobody can say, no, you don't do this. If it's yours, it's yours. If it's God has it for you, it is yours. Nobody can take it. 2010, I was sitting in uh, Central, looking there. I said, God, one day I want to lead worship. How many chords I knew? Four chords. But when you depend on God and you trust God and God says, you can do it, you can do it. But why do you want to do it is the main reason. Yes? Do you want to do it because people say, hey, very good, nice worship? Or do you want to do it to glorify God? Right? And here, the Apostle Paul, he's sharing, you know, he's just bringing out this whole understanding, not for his own gain. Not that people say, oh, Apostle Paul, you're greater than anyone else. His point was to bring people to Christ. That was his main intention. Right? If you read go going on, he says, uh, he brings out the gospel. I'm verse 24. He says, before that, he says, I'm going to reveal who this proclaim who this God is. And then he begins to share the gospel. The God who made the world, verse 24, and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human beings or human hands. And he is not served by hands as if needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. See, the God that you, you, we are worshipping is not a God who can stay in your small temple. And he is not a God who needs your hands to, you know, to do anything. He is a God who gave you life, who gave us life. He is proclaiming the gospel. Verse 26, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. So powerful. right? So he's trying to 
make these two people, the Stoics and the Epicureans, believe. You know, some of them said we are by chance, no? Some of them you just hear, but he's saying no, he created them. He's sticking to the point, right? He created each one of them. And he from one man he made a nation, right? And and gives men life and the breath and everything else. Here he's talking about, you know, he's trying to relate to the fire becoming a spark. He's saying, no, he gave life. He gave breath to the people. Now the people are, you know, their minds are opening. Wow. It's a God who created me to be in this place, to be in Athens, and to be here to listen to this message. And he created breath in my life. And that's why I'm living. Things are opening up, right? Then he goes on. Uh, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. Again, you see the words he's using. What does the Epicurean believe? God is somewhere else, far away. We are here. But here he's saying, he did this and God is not far from us. He's touching the main points. He's hitting the nail on the head. Sharp points. Right? Exactly what they believe, he's trying to bring out a defense for them. Right? Therefore, since we are all God's offsprings, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image made by God's by man's design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. What a powerful way of bringing the gospel. If we just read this without understanding the beliefs of Stoic, Stoicism and Epicurean, this will just be another passage. right? But when we understand the two belief systems and how Paul is trying to you know, relate the gospel to them, it's so powerful. right? He goes on. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Sneered means some of them said, what are you talking about? Man is born by chance. Man will die by chance. And that's the end of it. We don't believe in resurrection. This is a new ideology. This is a new philosophy. Some of them sneered, which means they said, this is rubbish. This is nonsense. And probably they would have walked off. But some of them said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. Look at this verse. This is so exciting. Verse 34. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Everyone say a few men. He shared the whole gospel. No, you don't have to repeat that. <laughs> he shares the whole gospel. A few men believed Paul, and that is where the church was planted. What does it say here? Became followers of Paul and believed them. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, right? And also a woman named Damaris, Damaris and a number of others. A member of the council. Maybe he was a lawyer, or maybe he was somebody who was a judge. In the council of the Aeropagus, there may have been hundreds of people, but the gospel touched him. He believed Paul. He believed in Jesus. And he and another woman named Damaris and a number of others accepted Christ. How? No praying for anointing, no praying for healing, no praying for deliverance. He didn't go near them, nothing. What did Paul do? He understood them and he reasoned with them. And that is how the church was planted. When you look later on, the church in Athens and Corinth, and then later on the people, uh, he goes into Corinth and starts there also. The churches 
in Asia Minor were thriving. These are the churches which began to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Prophesying, prophesying, word of knowledge, gift of healing, all started off with a simple, probably 10, 20 minute message that the Apostle gave. Now, what are the challenges we face? Somebody may come and say, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gay, I'm a homosexual, so, but I still believe in Jesus. What are you going to say? How are you going to minister to them? Some may, some may say, hey, uh, you know, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in you know, this other, other gods. All gods are one. That's the most famous thing. Right? All gods are one. Are you going to defend them? All gods are one. Oh, okay. You be happy. I'm happy. You don't give persecution. I won't give persecution. That's not what it is, right? So we must be willing to give a defense in the right way. Understand them. What was the outcome? Some mocked. Some wanted to hear more, and some believed. In a highly religious and intellectual place. Paul was able to start a church. So, can we translate that? Can we be a, be people? You know, you'll have people in uh, you know highly knowledgeable, highly intellectual people. Sometimes we stop. No, we think, oh no, they are they know everything in computers. So good for them, or they may know everything in business. Very intellectual. Scientists doesn't matter. What did Paul do? Paul didn't bring up all their, uh, you know, all their uh, achievements. He said, "This is what you all are, and I understand where you're coming from. But let me tell you what I understood." Now, Paul also was an intellectual, but he didn't put up his intellectual in a way that people were. You know, enticed or attracted to his intellectualism. They were attracted to Jesus. Paul said, the Bible says they believed in Paul and they believed what his message. What was his message? The gospel. And so even we, when we get opportunities, right? You may be, you know, just going out, you may see somebody uh, you know who looks like a very big intellectual or a big businessman. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel, oh, maybe I'll go to the slum only or those, you know, those uh, youth who don't know anything. I can go and talk to them. No. God has called us to understand and reason with everyone, whether intellectual, whether the rich, whether the poor. Everyone needs the gospel. Is that okay? Right? So don't, don't stop yourself. Now, you may go back to your hometowns, right? And you're probably serving in the church. Don't feel... Okay, this is a rich man or he's a politician, so I can't share with them. You share. But share with understanding and reasoning. Right? Again, very important. Do your homework. Don't just go and share. Spend time in prayer. Ask God to give you wisdom, to give you the right words. Right? The Holy Spirit gives the right words. He's the spirit of wisdom. Give you the right words at the right time. Prepare yourself. You see, the Apostle Paul did that, right? He prepared himself. Additional insights on how Paul ministered. He preached Christ and the work that he did on the cross. To understand reason, but to remember reasoning alone cannot do it. We must depend on the work of the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles. Right? So you reason, good, but that alone will not help. If they be become believers, like what happened to these few people, good. But follow that up with the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, expect signs, wonders, and miracles. And it's wonderful that the church in uh, Asia Minor, all churches in Asia Minor, were flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Church in Ephesus, Philippi, church in Corinth, they were all flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we see that Paul didn't use reasoning as the basis of everything. Yes, he reasoned, but he also taught them on the work of the Holy Spirit. But he depended on the Holy Spirit. 
another important point is do not get into meaningless arguments and debates. There will be times when people will try to argue and then there will be no meaning. There's, you know, they just go on, you know, but this is that, this is that. Avoid it. Right? Uh, can always stop and then say, hey, let's meet another time and discuss more on this. Right? So points to remember here um, while ministering to a Hindu, the existence of sin and evil, we discussed this. You can talk about karma, reincarnation, uh, leaves man as a victim of relentless cause and effect. Forgiveness contrasted with karma and reincarnation. So everything is uh, no concept of total and free forgiveness. So this is one option where we can just you know tell them, hey, it's not about our works. Nothing that we do is going to uh, please God, but it's only through uh, what Jesus did for us. Uh, Christ contrasted with many avatars, right? So you can look, I, I want to encourage you to read this book, Jesus Among Other Gods uh, by Ravi Zacharias. It's a wonderful book. It talks about Jesus, the uniqueness of who Jesus is. So you can bring out the uniqueness of Jesus, right? His, his sinless, he's perfect, he's, he's one, he's sufficient, he's, he's the one who uh, did the perfect work for the salvation of entire human race and then there's nothing more there's no one else who did miracles like he did there's no one else who is resurrected from the dead nobody there's no human proof even if people are resurrected they died again but jesus is resurrected he lives forever right and uh, we can see the contrast there then we see that a loving god seeking a personal relationship uh, contrasted with uh, self-effort, no other re religion provides a personal relationship. All other religions, it's about God. God is here, Father. God is here, and you are here. There's a separation, and we are trying to reach God. But here, in the message of the cross, Jesus, God is trying to reach man, and He does reach man. Right? And while speaking to a Muslim. Uh, very important. Muslims are unsure about their salvation. Right? They say, uh, if God wills, I will see him in paradise. I will be there in heaven. If God wills. There's no assurance. But we have a wonderful assurance. So you can bring out that aspect. Um, bring out or establish genuine friendship with people. and. Three things that people would normally question, whether Christ is Lord, whether he died on the cross, whether he rose from the dead. Now, these are points that we must come up with reasons uh, and good scriptures to minister to them. Right? Talking about sin, forgiveness, the fatherhood of God, and Christian life. So there's many things that we can do. Now... Even as we get these opportunities, make sure the opportunities that you get, you, you use it the right way. Now, initially, there will be times when you feel, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that, but I didn't. That's all right. But continue to grow in this you know, way of ministering to people. Right? Now, for example, you know, you're in the pastoral calling, you've got church, or you're a leader in the church, and people from other faiths come to church. As a leader, you must be willing to minister to them. You must reason with them. Right? As I said, you may be even a worship leader. They'll come and ask you. Must be willing to reason, willing to understand. Trust in God's word. And focus them on the truth. Lead them to the truth. And the truth will set them free. Right? Give them time. Understand them reason with them that okay yes right so whenever you get opportunities uh, just do that and i want to encourage you keep reading the book of acts because he goes on from here to corinth and he uh, then goes on to Thessalonica, and he begins to minister in different ways in these different places but in all these places a church was established right and without these churches and without these epistles 
There's so much that we would miss out. Right? Yes. Sorry? No, it's not here. It's in the next chapter. Yeah, yeah. OK, so thank you, everyone, for joining. Let's just close with a quick word of prayer, uh, and then we close. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful time, Lord, just to get together and learn your word. And we thank you for this wonderful epistle, Lord, of and even as we are learning and what the Apostle Paul did, oh God, I pray that you will enable each one of us to understand and reason and to minister with to people, oh God. Help us to be anointed and, and Lord, to trust in you, to trust in your word. And we pray, God, that you will empower us to do everything that you have called us to do. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, oh God, and may your name be glorified in each of our lives. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity you've given us, Lord, to serve you. Help us to serve you faithfully, diligently, to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Have a great week ahead. I'll see you next week.